We'll be turning to the book of Acts this time. And maybe thinking about sorrow from a slightly different perspective. We've been talking about the loss of others, but let's talk about, well, the loss of ourselves. Let's talk about our own lives and how we endure well and uh, head toward the end of our lives. I've been thinking about this because a a friend of mine not too long ago went to be with the Lord. Um, Just over a year prior to his death, he had been diagnosed with a very serious form of leukemia. The doctors tried every treatment they knew of. They tried a bunch of treatments that were experimental and borderline barbaric, really just um, some really horrible treatments along the way. And then eventually they just had to say, that's all, there's, there's nothing else we can offer you. So in his last few weeks, he was in hospice care, extremely weak, had to spend most of his time just resting, sleeping. But do you know how he spent his final days before he grew too weak to sit up or even to speak? He spent a good number of them on the phone. He called his Christian friends to encourage them in the Lord one last time. And he called his non-Christian friends to tell them about Jesus one last time. And I thought that is just a remarkable way to close out a life. And his life and his death got me pondering my own life and my own death. One of the first peers I've known who, who died. You know, I'm used to most of you and in your early years, you lose uncles or you lose the friends of your parents, you, re, you lose your parents. But you get to the stage of life when your peers begin to die. And this was really one of the first of my peers to go to be with the Lord. And that really got me pondering my own life and my own death. And he got me asking whether I'm living my life well and whether I'm preparing to die well. And death has a way of doing that, doesn't it? The very stark reality gets us thinking about our own lives, our own deaths. And so I thought it would be fitting for us to consider this together. Um, I want us, I want you to consider how to live well, to live a life that's pleasing to God today and for as long as God sees fit to give you. And the text I'd like to guide us is Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. Just a short little passage there, which says, For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. I'll structure our time around four words that will lead us through this verse and through our lives. The four words are serve, sleep, rest, and rise. Serve, sleep, rest, rise. As you think about what remains of your life, here's a way to, here's, the, here's how our text may direct you to think well, serve, sleep, rest, and rise. Begin with serve. The verse we're looking at today is drawn from a sermon, a sermon the Apostle Paul preaches in the city of Antioch. So he and Barnabas are on a missionary journey, and when they're spotted in the Jewish synagogue, Paul is invited to speak, as was the custom in that time. And he decides to use the opportunity to show that Jesus is the Messiah. What else is Paul going to do when he's invited to speak in a synagogue but to show that Jesus is the Messiah? And as he works toward this major point, who Jesus is, he offers a little thumbnail sketch of Old Testament history. And along the way, he gets to King David, and that's how he summarizes King King David's life. David served the purpose of God in his own generation. I just want to focus in on that statement and apply it to your life. And to do that, let's make some observations about it. First, God calls you to serve. If you want to live a life that's pleasing to God, you are called to serve. And if you're called to serve, what does that make you? It makes you a servant. A servant is somebody who works for a master and is accountable to that master. And our text tells us that David served God. In other words, even though King David was a king over Israel, he was a servant under God. And David often affirmed this. Just consider a handful of the Psalms he wrote. Psalm 18 is inscribed as a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord. Or Psalm 19, he prays, keep back your servant from presumptuous sin. Psalm 31, make your face shine on your servant. And so David was an earthly king who was a servant of the heavenly king. He led men, but he followed God. 
And if you want to live a life that's pleasing to God, the place to begin is to acknowledge before him that you're a servant, that you are his servant. Of course, it's not always easy because there's something deep within you that makes you want to believe that you are autonomous and you are independent, that you answer to nobody but yourself. There's something deep within you that makes you want to believe even that God should be your servant, that he should do your will, that God should follow your orders. But David had it right. He was a servant of God. He obeyed God. He answered to God. And I wonder, have you bowed the knee to God? Have you acknowledged that he is God and you are not? That he's the creator and you're the created. That he's the master and you are the servant. And have you asked God to forgive you for so often acting like the opposite is true? Because that's the original human sin, isn't it? To elevate yourself to the place of God and to lower God to the place of humanity, the place of yourself. Believe it or not, there is no better life than the life of a servant. There's no better life a human being can lead than the life of a servant when you're a servant to God. So like David, you're called to serve, to be God's servant. That's our first observation. And then second, like David, you're called to serve the purpose of God. Which means you're not here to serve the purpose of you. You're not here to serve the purpose of your parents. You're not here to serve the, the purpose of your pastors or professors or anybody else. The key to living a life that's pleasing to God is not to live out your own purpose, but to live out God's purpose. Admittedly, that can be very difficult to do. And right now we live in what some people are calling the age of authenticity. Maybe you've heard that phrase. We live in the age of authenticity. And so what we're told now, this will be, you'll understand it when I say this, we're told that deep within each one of us is an authentic self. And what we need to do is discover that authentic self and then begin to express it. Everything external to us, that's society with its rules and expectations, or families with their traditions and religions, or even our own bodies with their distinct sex and gender, all of that, we're told, can distract us from finding our most authentic self. And that's a problem, or so we're told, because it's only when we discover and only when we express this authentic self that's buried deep within, it's only then that we'll be happy. It's only then that we'll find fulfillment. It's only then that we'll live with true freedom and purpose. So if you ever wonder, why is it today that so many people are discovering that even though they were born with a male body, their authentic self is female, this is why. A generation ago, someone might have said, I'm a man who feels like a woman, but today he says, I am a woman, right? Because he believes his deepest and most authentic self is female, and that makes him female no matter what the externals would say or look like. That's why we keep hearing about these new identities or sexualities. People are desperate to personalize and, and define themselves, to craft their own self-definition. Just recently, I read in the news about a man who, who came to understand that his authentic self is homosexual. And so he broke up his marriage, and he left his wife, and he disrupted his family. And how do the people around him respond? With applause with affirmation. Even though he had caused such pain to others, the main thing was that he was being true to himself. And that, societally, is of the utmost importance. Now, I know the crowd I'm amongst here today, so I'm guessing that most of you wouldn't be tempted quite to go, down, go all the way down those different roads. But all of us are still prone to this desire to self-create which means you're prone to believe that you'll be happiest when you're able to create your own self, to define your own meaning, to determine your own purpose. But if you want to live well before the Lord, you need to serve God's purpose. That's not something you need to create. That's something you need to receive. That's not something that arises from within. It's something that's given from above. Instead of searching within the depths of your own soul, you need to search within God's word and he'll tell you your identity. He will give you your purpose. 
And you should be encouraged to know that God does have a purpose for you. God didn't create a single person who's unimportant or a single person who's redundant. If God created you, you have a purpose. You have a purpose that was assigned by the God who so carefully crafted you to be exactly who and what and where and how you are. So what is it? What are you here for? Well, your purpose, the reason God made you, is in the words of the Shorter Catechism, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Or in the words of John Piper, to glorify God and enjoy Him. Oh, sorry, where did I miss that? To glorify God by enjoying Him forever. It's to know God and to find great satisfaction in Him. Your purpose is to have a true and real and living relationship with God, to find your heart and soul delighted in Him. And it's to know that as you delight in God, you bring glory to God. You show God to be lovely and beautiful and worthy of praise. So my friend, you've been told there's an authentic self within you. The younger you are, the more you've been told this. The younger you are, the more this messaging is just deep within you. Like it's, it's the air you breathe. And you've been told that things like parents and authority and especially the Christian faith, all of these things will keep you from finding and expressing who you really are. You've been told you'll only be happy to the degree that you're able to discover and live out that innermost self-created, supposedly authentic self. But it's a lie. The path to happiness and fulfillment and contentment, the way to be your truest and best and most significant self is to orient yourself around God and his purpose, to find great delight in him, to bring great glory to him. And there's no better life than that because that's the very reason God has made you, to glorify him and enjoy him forever. And so our first two observations about this little text, you're to serve, you're to serve God's purpose, and now you're to serve God's purpose in your own generation. Because all of this delighting in God and all of this bringing glory to God, it does something to you. As you delight in God, you're transformed in the inner self and the outer self. In the inner self, you find that, I'm sure you found this, old longings are replaced by new longings. Ugly desires are replaced by holy desires. Sinful impulses are replaced by pure impulses. Vile thoughts are replaced by sweet thoughts. That's the inner self. Have you seen that transformation of your inner self over time as you delight in God and bring him glory? In the outer self, you find that instead of acting for your own glory, you act for God's glory. Instead of living for your own good, you live for the good of others. So as you find great joy and great delight in this relationship with God, you're transformed from the inside out. Your delight in God overflows It overflows into a mind that loves to ponder God and a will that loves to obey Him. It overflows into lips that love to speak His truth and hands that love to serve His people and feet that will go wherever He calls you to go. God's purpose for you is is to find such deep satisfaction in Him that you freely, gladly, joyfully live to bring glory to Him by doing good to others. That's your calling. That's how you serve the purpose of God in your own generation, by loving and serving and blessing the people around you. By taking advantage of each one of those divine appointments that God, by his providence, brings into your life. People who you cross paths with, people he brings for you to know and to love. You you deploy your gifts and talents and time and energy, enthusiasm, all you've got to do good to others and bring glory to God. There's an important connection between your delight in God and your usefulness to the people around you, or between your delight in God and living out your purpose. It is as you delight in God that you find delight in serving other people. It's as you find joy in God that you most joyfully serve and bless others. So the key to it all is to keep loving God and pursuing him to keep reading his word and praying to him, to keep joining with God's people to worship him. And as your delight in God grows, so will your longing to live for the good of other people. 
You ever have those moments where your heart is growing cold to other people instead of staying warm? Those moments where you find yourself pulling away from people instead of moving toward them? Those times when you realize you've become lax and just living your life for the good of other people. When that happens, you can go looking for, for solutions, but almost definitely, almost certainly what's happened is that your heart has grown cold to God. It's grown cold to other people because it's first grown cold to God. So the solution is if you stir up your delight in God, it will then stir up your delight in other people. So when you find that coldness toward other people, spend time with the Lord and reading and praying and meditating on the gospel. Ponder the gospel. Preach its truths to yourself. And worship God. Participate in the Lord's Supper. And your delight in God will motivate you then to bless the people who've been created in his image. Notice that David is deemed faithful for serving God's purpose in his own generation. God's calling on you is to serve faithfully in your own generation. The people God brings into your life. The people who cross your path. It's more than fine to live a life of faithful obscurity, to give all that you've got to serving your family and your church and your neighborhood. That is a good life, and that's a life that's pleasing to God. Your calling is to serve, to serve God's purpose, and to serve God's purpose in your own generation. And then what? What happens as you live that kind of a life? Well, that's our second heading, serve and then sleep. Back to Acts 13, verse 36. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep. Which means David faithfully served God's purpose, and then he died. The Bible often refers to death as sleep. And I'm so thankful that the Bible refers to death as sleep. Because there's real beauty. There's real comfort in that picture. See, death might scare you. Death scares all of us. But sleep? Sleep doesn't scare us. Sleep is familiar. Sleep is a friend. Sleep is a friend that just delivers you from night to day, from darkness to light. You know that once you've slept, you will awaken. You'll awaken and you'll have a new day. The Bible says that death exists only because if humanity's fallen to sin, if we had not sinned, we would not die. So death is a consequence of sin, and in that way, death is truly a terrible enemy. But as a Christian, you come to realize that death, even as it's an enemy, is also an ally. Why is death an ally? Because it releases you from this place of weariness. There's only one way. For 2,000 years, there's only been one way that anyone has left behind this, this world. All the pain and the sorrow and the grief and the illness we experience in this life, and it's to die, to fall asleep. That was the experience of King David so many years ago. He served the purpose of God in his own generation, and then he slept. And then what? Go to our text again. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers. Our third heading is rest, so serve, sleep, and rest. I love that little phrase we find all over the Old Testament, he was laid with his fathers. It's a euphemism for death, but it pictures something so beautiful, so meaningful. In a very literal sense, David was probably placed in a tomb where his ancestors had been buried. So in that way, he was literally laid with his fathers. But the term shows us more than that as well. Just as the remains of David and his ancestors were together in a grave, the souls of David and his ancestors were together with the Lord. So when David slept, he didn't enter into some kind of a soul sleep. He didn't go into a void of nothingness. He didn't become one with the universe, as people claim today. He went to heaven. He went to this place of rest. And so will you, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need a little precision here. When we, when we talk about heaven, we sometimes mean our final state, the new heavens, the new earth, our final destination after Christ's return. But we also sometimes mean an intermediate state, the place or the state that exists until the time when Christ returns. 
That's what I'm referring to now as our place of rest. The Bible actually doesn't tell us a whole lot about that state, but it does tell us that we're with the Lord and we're with one another. So Jesus said to that thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Key words, today, with me, paradise. And that paradise is a place of rest. We rest from sin. We rest from sorrow. We rest from pain. We rest from illness. We rest from the presence of all that's evil, from all the consequences of evil. We don't just rest from, we also rest with. We rest with our loved ones. We rest with those who have professed faith in the Lord and loved him. We rest ultimately with Jesus. Because whatever else is true of paradise, we know that it's the place where Christ is. Our souls rest with Jesus because our faith, so our, our souls rest with Jesus in heaven because our faith has rested with him here on earth. Because we've turned to him here, he will welcome us there. So when that day comes, that day comes when you fall asleep, the remains of your body will go into the ground just like David's did. Your body will experience decay just like David's did. Terrible, terrible things happen to human bodies when they die. But wonderful things happen to human souls. Your soul will be at rest. Your soul will be at rest with God and with all his people. Your body may sleep in the ground for years or centuries, but all that time your soul will be at peace and at rest. You'll be praising God and rejoicing in him and resting. First you serve, and then you sleep, and then you rest. Now, a time of rest will come to you, but it's not yet. It's not now. How do I know? Because you're still here. You're still alive. Which means God's purpose for you now is to work. That includes your vocational work, of course, your, your main calling in life, your job, whatever it is. But there's more to it than that. Your, your task from God is to fulfill the duty he's given you to do good to others. God calls you to glorify him and enjoy him right here, right now. To, to so delight in God that it overflows now into a life of blessing and serving other people. And God does not mean for you to rest from that work until he calls you home. So you think of my friend whose body had almost completely given up. At that time, his life was measured in days and hours rather than months and years. But he knew that as long as he had the least ability. Well, he could do anything at all. His work was not yet complete. So from his literal deathbed, he was expressing love to people, encouraging them, telling them about Jesus. Even though he had come to his final days, he had not yet come to that time of rest. A pilot can't clock out when his plane is halfway across the, the Atlantic Ocean, or even when his plane is on the final approach, right? His duty is to land that plane safely, deliver the passengers to the gate, and then he can stop. Then he can rest. And my friend knew that he had not yet been released from the duty God had given him, so he continued to delight and bless and love and serve all the way to the end. And if that's true of a man who's mortally ill... And how much more should it be true of those of us who are healthy and whole and able-bodied? How much more should it be true of you who are young and well and who may have many decades left ahead of you, many decades to enjoy God, delight in Him, be a blessing to His people? You know, it's my experience that as we live life, God sometimes sort of just interrupts us to lay a kind of burden on us. And it's in those times that we ought to make some kind of resolution about how to live well before him. And here's something to consider. Good question to ask yourself. What do I need to begin doing that will increase my delight in God? What do I need to begin doing that will increase my delight in God? 
And what do I need to stop doing that decreases my delight in God? And then in what ways out of the overflow of my satisfaction in God will I bless and serve his people? What will increase my delight in God? What will decrease my de delight in God and therefore must be taken away? And then out of the overflow of my delight in God, how will I bless and serve his people? How is God calling me specifically to bless and serve his people? Resolve to delight in God. Resolve to serve God's purposes by serving God's people and resolve to keep doing it until you fall asleep and enter into your rest. And we will come to a time of rest. But even this rest we're talking about is not a permanent state because God has something better in store. We serve, we sleep, we rest, and then we rise. Remember that these words about David are part of a sermon by the Apostle Paul. And what he wants his Jewish listeners to understand is that Jesus is the Messiah. He needed them to know this. Jesus is the Messiah that they have been waiting for. So let's see how he shows this to them. First, he looks back to Psalm 16, a psalm that David had written hundreds of years before. So in the sentence right before the one we're looking at today, Paul quotes a line from that psalm, Acts 13, verse 35. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One see corruption. So Paul quotes that line from Psalm 16. It's like he just leaves this question hanging in the room. Who was David talking about? Who is this holy one who will not see corruption? See, nobody ever doubted that David's body did what bodies do when they die. David's body decayed. It saw corruption, according to Paul's words. And so here's what he's asking them to figure out. What did David mean when he said, you will not let your holy one see corruption? If he wasn't referring to himself, then who is he referring to? Paul has the answer. Verse 36, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. It's like he's asking his Jewish listeners there, so who did God raise up? Who in human history has died but did not experience decay or decomposition? We know who it is. It was the Lord Jesus Christ because God raised him from the dead. And so the point Paul's making is this. Jesus is the Messiah and we know this because he was raised from the dead. He is the Holy One who did not see corruption. You're thinking about David and those key words, serve, sleep, rest, rise. But you know who else did all of that? Jesus did. So and all these things were following ultimately in his footsteps. What did Jesus do when he was here on earth? He served. He said of himself, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. Or as Paul wrote in Philippians, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus lived to serve God by loving people. And then what? He slept. There on the cross, he bowed his head, he breathed his laugh, he gave up his spirit. He was as dead as David. He was as dead as you and I will someday be. Then he rested. Late on Friday, his body was taken off the cross and placed in a tomb, and it lay there Friday night and Saturday morning and Saturday night. No breath, no heartbeat, no life. But on Sunday, he stirred. And he stood to his feet and he rose from the dead and his body and soul were reunited and he was as alive in that moment as he had ever been. And he's alive today. He's alive forevermore because Jesus served and Jesus slept and Jesus rested and Jesus rose. And because he rose, you will rise. His resurrection was a down payment. It was proof that guaranteed your own. It was proof that you too will be raised. And when you rise, you'll be reunited with your body, just like Jesus was, but a body that's been made perfect. You'll have a perfect soul that resides in a perfect body to live forever in a perfect world. That, to me, sounds perfect. And that's the hope we have in Jesus. This is the hope we have in the gospel of Jesus. And so we ask, what, what difference does this make in your life? As, as you consider the days ahead, the years ahead, what difference does this make? Well, we can work backwards. 
A day will come when Christ will raise you from the dead. Before you rise, you will rest. Before you rest, you will sleep. And before you sleep, that's today. That's here, that's now. So how will you live when you know that this is the time for wakefulness? This is the time for action. This is not the time for sleep and this is not the time for rest. You don't know how long you have to live, but you do know how to live that time well. The life of meaning and the life of significance is the life of a servant, to be a servant like Jesus, to be a servant like David, to be a servant like my friend, all of these who served faithfully to the very end. You don't need to be famous. You don't need to be wealthy or beautiful or powerful. You just need to be faithful to be faithful in the short time that God gives you, to serve out your days for something bigger and something greater than yourself, and then to go and be with God forever. The best life is the one that's lived to serve God's purpose in your own generation. A life of knowing God and enjoying God and finding great delight in God. And then out of the overflow of that delight, to love and bless and serve to give all you've got to do good for others and bring glory to God. And even though this is where this probably was meant to end, just give me a couple more minutes, because I want to tell you, I, I began preparing this message a few months ago and sat down on a Monday and spent some time in it and Tuesday and Wednesday. And by Wednesday, it was in roughly the form you just heard. And then on that evening, the friend I've been talking about called me. And he just wanted to say goodbye. And he wanted to offer a few words of encouragement. He wanted to take some time just to express his praise to God for all of his goodness and all of his kindness he had experienced in the 50 years of his life. And then he asked if I would pray for him. So he said there was something specific he wanted me to pray for. There were still four people on his list Four people that he knew didn't yet know the Lord and he hadn't yet had the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. So he wanted me to pray that God would allow him to live long enough just to speak to all four and to tell them one last time of the glories of Jesus Christ and encourage them to repent and believe. So I prayed for my friend that night and told him I loved him and we said our goodbyes. And that's it for our friendship on on this side of the grave. And after we spoke that day, he became too weak to talk, but I did check in with his family and he had indeed talked to all four of those friends that were left on his list. He told all four of them about Jesus and gave all four of them the opportunity to turn to Christ. Then his time came. And in that day, it was said of my friend, my friend who fittingly was also named David. David served the purpose of God in his own generation. He fell asleep, he was laid with his fathers, and then we know the story doesn't end there, does it? We know that the story of his life is really just getting started. He has served, he fell asleep, right now he is resting, and soon enough, soon enough he will rise, along with you and with me and with all of God's people. What a God and what a gospel. Amen. Thanks for letting me tell you, but let me pray. Our Father, we thank you that you're such a glorious God, and we thank you that we proclaim such a glorious gospel. We thank you for, thank you for friends who demonstrate the way to live and even the way to die. Thank you for entrusting to us um, these people who have lived so fittingly, whether David the king or David the friend, we thank you for them. We pray that each one of us would be faithful to serve you in the generation you've called us to serve. Let us be faithful to do that and look forward to the day we can sleep, the time we can rest, and the day we will rise to be with you and one another forever and ever, world without end. Amen.